evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Jason Johnston, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Mark Shepard, who has traveled from Wisconsin to discuss his 25 plus years of experience in growing a diversity of crops on his 106 acre perennial agricultural savanna, New Forest Farm. Mark is the CEO of Forest Agriculture Enterprises, author of Restoration Agriculture, and a proponent of sustainable agriculture generally. His particular focus is working within ecological and climate systems to produce multiple crops in the same space and planning for successive crops over not only multiple years, but over multiple decades. We enjoyed a nice lunch speaking with Mark about his strategies to maximize land use value by raising multiple plant crops and animals on the same acreage and still generating a profit, even if each individual crop does not produce maximal yield. As a forest ecologist and part-time hops farmer, I find Mark's combination of approaches and integration of so many plants into one production system very interesting, and I know you will too. So let's give Mark a warm welcome. Matter of fact, these cousins 
were, were also former Mainers. And uh, my, my dad's side of the family was all from Maine. I'll explain that a little later. This is also where I learned how to spell. Don't take lessons from that. <laughs> so uh, this industrial collapse idea, the fact that what you took for granted as the way things are and what normal is all of a sudden can change literally overnight, poof, and then these, these cities and these jobs and these factories just clean out. Another thing that changed almost overnight was in 1974, the Oil Producing and Exporting Countries um, Association, whatever they call themselves, OPEC, decided to cut off fuel supplies to the U.S. And in Massachusetts, um, that, that picture is not taken in Massachusetts before I was in Massachusetts. Uh, they rationed gasoline to 10 gallons a week, and you could, you could only go on uh, like an audit or even day based on your last digit of your, uh, of your license plate number. And how many of you guys are the oldest sibling in the family? All right, you will all back me on this. The next sibling down never did squat. They never pulled their weight. So there was three of us. There was myself, my younger brother, and my little baby brother. This is back when car seats could be in the front seat. So my baby brother's in the car seat with, next to my mom. He's throwing Cheerios all over the place, screaming. It's 400 degrees outside. He's cooking in the car. It's a zoo. My mom's freaking out. She was a hairbrush gal, and so she didn't frequently use a hairbrush not to comb your hair, but to like keep it in line. And so while we're in this gas line, like half a mile long gas line, all of a sudden the car runs out of gas. Okay, so the two big boys, age 10, is a big boy, uh, we got to get out and push. So those of you who are the older siblings, did my next to younger brother help at all? Yeah. And when you're 10 years old and you're pushing a car in a gas line that's a half a mile long, and you're thinking about you know, your dad being unemployed because the factories went away, and you're thinking about this river that's toxic and polluted, but it actually can get cleaned up if you like stop putting the pollution in there, and the fact that we are so critically dependent on fossil fuels, it kind of changed me. It really kind of really bugged me. We have to come up with some solutions to major world problems yesterday, and it's, it's not even a debate anymore because this kind of sudden stop can happen tomorrow, literally can happen tomorrow. <clears throat> where, where I was raised in Massachusetts, north central Massachusetts, was home of this place, this guy right here. This is Luther Burbank. Luther Burbank is the plant breeder who is credited with more named varieties to his name than any other human being yet on the face of the planet, over 800 plant varieties to his credit. He did that before we even knew what a chromosome was, let alone inheritance, uh, let alone DNA or any of that. He did it through a process called mass selection, which is virtually identical to what nature does, except that we, he inserted the human element and started to select based on values instead of surviving out of nature. Like a maple tree, for example, puts out 10 Brazilian seeds. Out of those 10 zillion seeds, maybe only half of them survive, so now there's five zillion left. You see all these little seedlings on the ground. And then through the years, more and more of those seedlings die and fall away and fall away until maybe eventually down the line there's one or two trees to replace the original that was there. So by, by rolling the genetic dice a zillion times and planting seedlings, zillions and zillions and zillions of seedlings, and then selecting for human values, in my case I select for speed to reproduction, um, cold hardiness, pest and disease resistant, and they have to be site adapted without any inputs whatsoever or else they don't get to reproduce. <clears throat> Let's um, take, for example, something we've probably heard before. Uh, who, who's heard something like similar to this? Uh, don't save the seeds from your apple because they won't come out true to type. And besides, it's going to take a thousand seeds before you get one good variety anyway. You guys heard something that's similar to that? Well, first of all, they don't breed true to type. That's just pure bull uh, lie. Um, if you, how many people have ever heard of anybody planting an apple seed and having it come up as anything other than an apple? They breed true to type. They don't turn into something that's exactly like their parent. And that's the whole point of sexual reproduction is you don't look exactly like your parents and you don't look like yours and so on and so on. And in the natural world, you want to have variation and variability because this one might be more fit to survive for whatever the reasons are. And so Luther Burbank was the, was the champion. It was actually in mass selection for a while. It was called the Burbank game. That's how you find new superior varieties through mass selection. Also grew up um, on the other side of the hill from where I was was this fellow right here, John Chapman. And John Chapman was, you know, predated, of course, Luther Burbank by a lot. 
And he would go around to um, cider mills and grab apple pomace, the squeezings from um, apple cider. And he planted apple trees all the way out into, into Ohio. It was part of like a real estate deal because while he was selling these trees to other people, he's doing some sort of activity on the land. He could get a, a business trade manufacturing site through the homestead laws. And then the people who planted those fruit trees on their property, they showed that they're proving up on their homestead claim. Uh, so he inadvertently was a, 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 one of the people responsible for this massive explosion of, of total number of apple varieties available in North America that were, wow, guess what? Site adapted and adapted to the soil, the weather, the pest and disease regime, where they were planted. How did we know that they were pest and disease resistant? Because if they weren't, people would cut them down or they would just plain die. So he was one of the large uh, selectors of, of apple varieties in uh, North America. Uh, another neat aside is this book right here. Um, I think the book is called The Captive, is what the title is. The first uh, written uh, book written by a, a female in um, North America was written by Mary Rowlandson. Uh, she was captured by uh, the Native Americans at the time during the, the King Philip's War, and she was um, dragged around through the woods. She had uh, her oldest daughter was like abused and molested until she died. Her three or four year old daughter starved to death over the winter, and her nursing baby starved to death also during the winter time. She was eventually ransomed and came back, and she wrote about her, her experiences. Uh, the foundation of their homestead is still there. And what's really fascinating about it is you go to where this old homestead was. There's the rocks where, where the, the, the building layout was. And you can see over there, there was a horseradish patch. There was like, the, there's a whole bunch of onions over there. There's a whole bunch of flowers over there. So these perennial crops that she planted almost 250, maybe 300 years ago, are still around. They're, her crops are still underground. It was at about that time, I was in my teenage years, I discovered this book. Any of you guys ever heard of this? It was originally written in 1926. I highly recommend looking it up. It's available free online. Um, Tree Cross by J. Russell Smith. It's the first time I ever heard of these two words put together, permanent agriculture. And I'd never really thought about it before, but the majority of human calories come from annual plants. And you know, my dad was a big gardener, and so I knew all about gardening. And I'm the smallest of three boys, and so we had to grow a lot of food during when, when my dad's unemployed and there's no more factories hiring and can't get fuel for the car, we've got to grow a big garden. Um, and so I realized how much work it was to, to plant this garden, to, to till the ground, to pull the weeds, to make the compost, and you pile all this organic matter up, it decomposes, it turns into a tenth of what it was, and you put it in a wheelbarrow, you haul it out in the garden, you throw it out there, you have like 15 crumbs of black, beautiful, rich compost all over the garden. And that's fertilizer? It was, to me, it was like nothing but slave labor. You gotta be out in the sun, I'm getting covered with dust, because once again, who was not helping me out with this project? The oldest boy had to go out and do it, because I was responsible, and you know better. It's like, who taught me to be responsible? No better, I don't know. Whereas, as soon as I was finished with my chores in the garden, I could go run off into the woods, and there were wild grapes and raspberries, uh, and hickory nuts and hazelnuts, there's all kinds of blueberries and wild abundance that's going out in the woods. And Smith here, he was uh, 1926 when the book was first written. In America, people really were starving. How can we feed Americans? And the USDA funded him, we'll go back, Oop. USDA funded him to go around the country and then around the world finding some sort of solution to the erosion problem because by then tractors had become ubiquitous and now we could plow fields, more fields than before. Uh, soil was washing away and people were starving, especially in hill, hill country um, territory, all of the Appalachians, all the way up through Ohio. Um, people were um, you know, seriously impoverished who were farming. And so he went around the USA and then around the world looking at different cultures where they grew tree crops um, he focused primarily on tree crops for feed for animals, so we could grow our trees up high, uh, and the seed, the, the seeds and the uh, fruit would be for livestock feed, and then we could grow something on the ground in between in the alleys. But it's these two words right there really stuck in my mind, and I thought, well, gee, if I could, at my folks' place, if I could take the woods and kind of move it out into the garden, and if I could move the garden, or 
grab it and pull it off into the woods. I'd have the best of both worlds. I could probably do a lot less work in the garden area and get just as much food. Um, you know, and, and being obsessed about that since I was a teenager, um, I've proven that to be true. That, that actually, actually is uh, factually true. But of course, the pressures of life, you got to go to go to a good school, get a good job, and all that kind of whatever. So I went to Worcester Polytechnic Institute in, in Worcester, Massachusetts, um, uh, to become a mechanical engineer, studied materials, um, got out of there, got a job working for the military, and I found myself on the crew that invented the first Kevlar infantry helmet. And it had nothing to do with me. I was just it was just a job that I had and all that kind of stuff. And, and one morning, um, after a funny Friday at work, my boss said, Mark. I want you to test in uh, 400 helmets, test and package 400 helmets because they were still experimental at this time. Pack them in boxes and ship them off to Fort Rucker, Alabama before you go home tonight. It's like, Lenny, Lenny, I'm 21 years old, it's Friday afternoon. I wouldn't be able to finish that till 9 o'clock tonight. He says, I don't even care if it takes him until 2 o'clock in the morning. You don't leave this place till those helmets go to Fort Rucker. It's like, nah. So it only took me till around 9. I shipped the helmets out, go for a great weekend, had a blast. I don't even remember what I did. Ha! <laughs> There's probably a reason why I don't remember what I did, but we don't need to talk about that. So then Monday morning, I come downstairs, um, turn on the television. That's when they invented the television remote. I turn on the television with the remote, push the button on the Mr. Coffee to make coffee, and I watch my helmet land on the beach in Grenada. And so I got a lesson in, in the fact that even when we're not aware of it, our actions as individuals ripple out from us like, like rings around a pebble that you throw into a still pond. No matter what we do, our and some of our most fundamental choices, one being food, what we eat for food, how that food was grown has everything to do with the economy, with, with social justice, with, with how the land is treated, and whether that land is actually in a state of aggradation and increasing health and fertility, or if it's in a state of degradation and decreasing health. And so all of our actions really, really, really matter. So I'd like, I'd hope that all of you become a lot more conscious about our food choices. Where does our food come from? And then the whole buy local movement, I'm just going to touch on this real quick. It's a little bit tricky because I think it was five years ago now, we had a huge drought in the Midwest. And um, if, if everybody was local food only, and there's a huge drought, everybody would have starved. We kind of need to have a both and. We need to have like a core subsistence food economy that can transport things all over the place because there's going to be times in this part of Maine that you're not going to get whatever it is. Um, even if, like broccoli for example, what happens if like Eastern Scarabean broccoli, horn hooter comes in and destroys all the broccoli around here. You guys are out of broccoli if you're totally dependent on broccoli. The food service down the hallway here, they aren't totally dependent on local. They're buying as much local as they can, but there's other options. We need a both and instead of either or thinking when we're doing this. I quit my job. I didn't want to be directly responsible for, for you know, other kids my age getting shot to pieces. So I went to Unity College. You guys even heard of Unity College? Okay. <laughs> you guys, I, I understand you go to a superior educational you know, institution and all that. You see, did the uh, superior way when I saw it. Um, at the time, it was the only uh, exclusively environmental studies uh, college in North America. And it, and it spanned everything from law enforcement to outdoor recreation to you know, the hard sciences, ecology, and, and biology and zoology and stuff like that. <clears throat> I think it's in the 90 percentile. In 90 plus percent of all the game wardens in the state of Maine went to Unity College. And just to kind of show that I'm not some kind of distinguished lecturer from outside, um, the bones of my grandfathers are buried in Springfield, Maine, uh, dating back to 1820. This was the oldest uh, tombstone that I could find online. Quickie, I've got pictures of them. But my fourth great grandfather came over from Wales and uh, lived in the Springfield, Maine area. He came over in 1820. Uh, his son, my great 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 uncle, was killed in the Battle of Deep Bottom. If you guys are ever into history, studied the 11th Regiment, the 11th of Maine, had the highest percentage casualties of any unit in the Civil War. And I think part of the reason why is because these guys were 
rough and tough Maine boys back in the 1860s. These guys could handle the woods, and as soon as they got down to the parade grounds in Washington, D.C., McClellan said, get these bush rats out of here. He sent them down to Grant, and they did two suicide missions. Um, that's where they lost most of their guys. And my great 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 grand uncle died in the Second Battle of Deep Bottom. My great 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 grandfather walked into his superior officer at the time and he said, You will summarily dismiss me from the U.S. military or I will walk out the store and you will shoot me. And so he was given a crazy discharge. <laughs> um, UV College of Maine looks familiar, doesn't it? Very similar to here. Well, from that, uh, I found myself in a laboratory keying insects taking them out of formaldehyde and identifying insects. What am I doing this for? I wanted to be an ecologist. So I ran off to Maine and went up to this neck of the woods right over there. Um, and this was where my cab, built my cabin. The Homestead um, Act of 1860. I got a, a home site up on about 3,500 foot elevation. And if you want to go out to the road, one way to do it is hike up the valley about 12 miles and take it right here. This mountain range is the uh, Boundary of Wrangell St. Elias National Park, the clouds are coming off of uh, the Nabisna Glacier, which is the longest terrestrial glacier in North America. You get a drink of water at the pond. These are the foothills to the big guys, the Wrangells. These are the Wrangells right here. The largest collection of mountains in excess of 10,000 feet in North America. You walk between these over here, you get over there, you paddle between two lakes, you portage over a piece of land, cross the river, get in the car, and then drive to town six hours. Um, <laughs> The, the, in, in, the interior of this little cabin was approximately the size of your bathroom. Uh, and if it's 50 below zero outside, um, you don't go outside for very much at all. You, know, you collect some snow, you melt some snow. Uh, it was there that I ran into this. And once again, I saw this combination of terms, permanent and agriculture, permaculture. How many of you guys have heard of permaculture? Oh my gosh, we got some, okay. Um, I highly recommend reading the Permaculture Designer's Manual by Bill Mollison, the founder, definer of the word and, and founder of the whole movement, uh, and not necessarily uh, jumping in right away to a lot of follow-on literature, because this is basically a design framework. How do we design ecosystems that will supply humans with their food, fuels, medicines, fibers, etc.? And that's that was the uh, scale. Bill Mollison was, was my trainer and signed my certificate. And I learned how to do permaculture, permanent agriculture, in a pretty harsh environment. I was up, you know, just 300 miles shy of the Arctic Circle. Um, by now, it's already socked in. It's already in snow. You can't. I don't think they can cross the rivers or lakes yet. Um, you can walk a straight line 300 miles to the Pacific Ocean across. No roads, no houses, no people. You cross the Bagley Ice Field, which is the third largest ice field in uh, North America. <clears throat> it was kind of cold. My sweetheart at the time. Um, and what I found myself, I'm on the front lines of something that I'd only heard about before. And I was on the front lines of how modern agricultural civilization destroys its planet in order to feed itself. Because look at all these trees. These are all spruce trees growing on these nice alluvial soils that were outwashing the mountains on the left. And then all of a sudden, here's this neighbor. Uh, in, in the course of only four or five years, clear cut every single tree off of this property in order to open it up. Because after all, if you want a homestead, you've got to clear the land. You want a farm, you've got to clear the land. And so he cut all these trees down. Uh, and it's like, well, no, I'm not going to destroy my ecosystem in order to feed myself. This is happening around the world on a massive scale. We're destroying the actual ecosystems that, that give us oxygen. All kinds of foods can come from these. This actually is providing uh, food for all kinds of wildlife, um, ecological services that we, we don't even really know or understand yet, and it can provide us with our nutrition if we figure out how to farm some way other than this way. It's kind of ridiculous. <clears throat> this picture right here I just took two years ago. It's in, um, uh, this is in Uganda, northern Uganda. And you notice how the sky is kind of hazy there. How many years before this picture was taken was it a high tropical forest with, complete with chimpanzees living in it? How many years before this picture was taken? Somebody just guess. Four, four years. First of all, the charcoal burners come in, they start cutting all the trees down, they make it into charcoal that they sell at the road for money to buy food and alcohol mostly, and then 
pretty soon they got no more trees, and so they move into the next piece of forest, and then the subsistence homesteaders come in and try to scratch a living in this hot tropical soils. They kind of go under, they end up selling their land to these multinational conglomerates and buy it all up and start growing things. This is all part of the U and I sugar company. Um, and what it results in on a global scale, this kind of stuff, it results in uh, about 50% of the soils on planet Earth are in the state of either severely being degraded, moderately uh, severe, to high severity. And what lands are these? These are all our agricultural lands. And one of the reasons why that's happening is we're destroying the ecosystem that's in place, we're oxidizing the organic matter in the soil, which is killing the soil life, we're eroding the soil in the rain, washing it away in the wind. So how do I feed myself without destroying this beautiful place? This is my whole challenge. How do I do this? How do I fit into this ecology instead of destroy it and replace it with, you know, beans, which I don't even like because they give me gas. Um, how do I convert this into this? Because roundaboutly, after a while of being in Alaska, um, in case you hadn't known about it, it's kind of harsh living out in the bush of Alaska. It takes a lot of work just to like get by, and you spend a lot of time throwing sticks into a wood stove, wondering what on earth you're doing with your life. <laughs> so, um, decided to try what I learned up there. You know, learned first of all through through my studies in ecology, and applied on the land up in Alaska. Let's take it now to the farm scale. Let's go to all these different agricultural properties to show an example of how we convert an annual crop field that's been in a state of decline for years and years, otherwise it wouldn't need fertilizer. Let's turn it around ecologically, upgrade it ecologically, and have it pay the bills along the way. And so the process that we use to do that starts with identifying a biome in its dominant plant community types. What grows here? Where do we live? This is you know, northeastern Maine. Um, what are the different plant communities? And plant communities I'll talk a little bit about later. There's groupings of plants that live together in a place. They just do. And if you see one of these, you'll probably find its associates with it. So we imitate that, and we're going to have something that's probably locally adapted and adaptable. Uh, then because of the um, uh, the insults from annual agriculture, compaction, soil compaction, um, hard pan layers, etc. Uh, water doesn't infiltrate these soils like they used to. Let's do a little bit of earthworks to manage the water resource, get it to soak in, spread out. And then let's establish perennial polycultures, identified in step one, using the agroforestry techniques. Now, the term polyculture means a lots of different uh, species of plant in this, or animal in the same place. Um, if you look at the ditch on the side of the road, anywhere you're going up and down the road here, it's a polyculture of plants. It's not a solid stand of just this or just that. And if you look at them, they, can, they sort themselves out. There's you know, like this low layer of grasses, there's this medium layer of certain kind of, you know, like hard annuals and perennials, and you've got like shrubs, you've got canes, you've got vines, you've got small trees, you've got tall trees, all of it in the same place. How can we imitate that in an agricultural system? And in all of our fences and roads, pipelines, et cetera, will follow the pattern. So on the aerial photographs that you see of New Forest Farm, all these squiggles are part of how the water is managed to move around the property. And then we manage for, for eternity. And how we manage is critically important, is we imitate the natural disturbance regimes of an area. What are the disturbances that occur here in Maine? We'll talk about them, this part of Maine uh, a little bit further on. But we want to imitate the effects of those disturbances. So we want to be just like how nature would deal with it as we as we interact with this. And I've got all kinds of like the real downer stuff, but I'm in, um, in the being considered at the time, I'm just going to flash through this. If we have to double our, our world food supply by 2050 just to meet demand for the Earth's population, that means still by 2050, like 25 to 30 percent of the human race goes to bed hungry at night. I think that's a crime. We can do better than that. And one of the things about this whole um, agricultural production increase, the UN is only looking at tillable agricultural soils, which are usually flattish alluvial soils that are already rich in fertility. And we just don't have that much left anymore on the planet. So how, how can we do this? If, we, if you look at our graph, by the time 2050 rolls around, we're going to be pushing 10 billion people. That's a lot of people to feed. We, can't afford to think small when we're thinking about redesigning our agriculture. Um, one of the problems also is most of the people, I 
think it's close to 50% of the human race right now, doesn't even exist within the economy. Got it? They don't exist within the economy. They don't have jobs. Yeah, they'll use money and stuff when they can get it. It's all barter, it's trade, it's you know, black market, underground market. Having, having market-based farms and farm products in the U.S. is a great idea, but who do you sell it to when nobody has any money left? And if all the people showing up are coming in these countries where everybody's poor and doesn't have any money, where are they going to come up with? One of the things that, that's also really critical is as people do become more prosperous, and India and China are the biggest examples, and so is in uh, Middle Eastern oil producing countries, as people become wealthier, they, uh, they actually want more dairy and more meat. You know, protein is very expensive in the economy of nature in order to make protein. And so to, to let's take uh, beef, it takes 10 pounds of feed to make one pound of beef. I don't know what the feed conversion ratio is on a human being, but it probably takes you know, X pounds of something to make one pound of human. Um, if you have a higher concentration of protein and fats in your diet, it's easier to build a faster to build a human body instead of eating lots of you know, carbohydrates with small amounts of protein. There. So according to how the UN is looking at things, is this is what we need more of in order to feed the human race. We need to destroy more of the planet in order to grow more grains. <sighs> to do this, to have these feedlots that cover miles and miles and miles of valleys in Idaho and California um, just to grow stuff, that first of all, cattle are not even designed to eat it. Think about it. How many of you guys are biologists? We got, oh, we got one. Where did he go? We got two. All right. We can tell what a creature is designed, created, adapted, or evolved to eat looking at its dentition and its gastrointestinal tract. We know what they eat. It's easy to tell what they eat. We look at their teeth. These guys have big teeth for ripping flesh and, and tearing it and gobbling it down quick. <clears throat> Same here with the dog. Like these horses and the cows, they can pull on plant parts, and then they got hardly, you know, there's no canines on a cow, there's like these residual canines on a horse, and then you got these big molars for grinding plant parts. Well, we got this strange creature over here. What's, what's that face designed to eat? Well, about 50% of our teeth are molars used for grinding plant parts. Maybe 50% of our diet <coughs> should be good, rough, green, leafy vegetables. Sounds good to me. And then we have, um, hell, these 12 teeth are our incisors for ripping, tearing things like fruit uh, or, you know, or other plant parts in order to get it to our molars. And we have four canines, possibly for tearing meat off of bones. So what if we were to switch our diet to eating 50% plants um, plus our 12 to 17% fruits? We're only eating like two, three, four percent um, animal products. That probably would make a lot of dietary difference. One of the interesting things, so I, I, side, I side with the vegetarians on this. This is an ecological crime. This is wrong. I also side with the people who are saying that for, to lessen our food footprint, we need to eat more plant-based diet. I agree, absolutely agree. But uh, a cow is not a cow, and a chicken is not a chicken, and a pig is not a pig. What that animal eats makes a huge difference, and how, what its role is in an ecosystem makes a huge difference as well. And furthermore, we aren't designed to eat grains and legumes. We're missing two critical organs. One is called a crop and the other is a gizzard. We have this itty bitty tiny little pancreas over here that's for, for uh, digesting our um, carbohydrates and we've got this gigantic liver which helps us to assimilate our fats and our proteins. Looks like we should be having lots of fats and proteins and not much grains and then you look at the diseases, the dietary diseases that are affecting human beings. We're overtaxing our pancreas by eating too many grains and legumes. So this is a big push. We've got to feed more people we're using less land and water. Close the gap. We have very limited potential to increase arable land. True. We really can't increase uh, arable land by that much. Maybe by starting to re-collect uh, the soils in our river deltas, we can. And improved living standards have been proven to increase protein consumption. This is not true right here. Requiring more grain for animal feed. A cow is not designed to eat grains and legumes. It's designed to eat grass and twigs and leaves. So it should be eating what it's designed to eat, not uh, something that it's, it's uh, not designed to eat. It says here, the only solution is to increase agricultural productivity. Well, no, it's not the only solution. That's one of the solutions. It's to increase agricultural production at the same time um, doing ecological restoration on, on a global scale. And that's what restoration agriculture is all about. Uh, 
We also have to do this in the real world. This was a year ago, 2017. All the red was spring was three weeks early by uh, February. By April, spring was three weeks early and all of the red across here. It's one of the craziest, earliest springs on record. Doesn't matter who caused this problem or if the problem's being caused by anybody. It doesn't matter if the climate's changing or it's not changing. It doesn't matter whether it's warming or it's cooling. It is irrelevant to a farmer who has to survive this year and today and next year. We have to be able to survive reality on the ground, and currently, right now, reality on the ground has a lot of crazy weather statistics associated with it. Now, how do you get to the truth on what's happening with the weather and climate? It's all fake news. It's fake news. Well, it, where it's not fake are the actuarial societies that are doing all the math behind the scenes for the insurance companies. Insurance companies are, are big bookie rackets. And they're making bets on reality. They're not making bets on fake news. They're, they're making bets based on actual observable statistics. And what they're noticing is that, um, what's that, 300 or factor of three times more uh, tornado touchdowns since 1950. What I like about this is say, oh, there's no reason for this. Well, there doesn't need to be a reason for this, okay? It is happening. We have to be able to adapt to it. Well, one of the reasons why the whole restoration agricultural idea is to mimic our natural plant communities and um, especially using lots of perennials is all the plants around here in this part of Maine have had drought, they've had floods, they've had fire, they've had ice storm, they've had all of the problems that you could ever possibly have with agriculture and they are still here, they're surviving. And we've even been attacking them with saws for the past 200 years and they're still here, they still keep coming back. That's sustainable if you ask me. 20, 19 of the 20 biggest floods in my part of Wisconsin have happened in the past 30 years. One of the neat things that especially you younger folks um, have is an amazing opportunity of the degraded crap, garbage, throwaway land that's out there. Degraded land is available all over the country. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Don't ever believe the myth that young people can't get into farming because they can't afford the land. Well, young people can't get, afford to get into farming in an old, outdated system that's overcapitalized with too much money invested in junk that's worthless, and not enough people are thinking about buying a strip mine and rehabbing it and actually farming it and have it pay its way, or buy a clear cut. I got started in clear cuts down, um, down by Springfield, Maine, total of five of them in a row, that you, you, you buy the property, do this restoration egg rehab, it's now worth more money. You build a little recreational cabin with the salvaged wood, you get an appraisal, it's worth more money, you borrow up to the appraisal, you go buy the next one. You go borrow up to the appraisal, you pay off the first one, you buy the next one, and so on and so on and so on. We can, we can do this at a profit, even if it's just as a real estate racket, we're gonna go plant food everywhere we go. Food ecosystem. So the real name of this workshop could be restoring the land while regenerating our communities. Because what happens when my property becomes prosperous, and I teach you to become prosperous, and you to become prosperous, and you and you and you, pretty soon we have this net prosperity going on where we're at. We can now afford things together um, that we couldn't, like for processing equipment, value added, uh, etc. <clears throat> There's a term being banded about these days, regenerative agriculture. And I kind of like the trend, it's nice that it's going on, but unfortunately it's being driven mostly by certifying agents, uh, agencies that want to charge farmers, again, for the service of giving them a label that says, oh, you're regenerative, and or it's companies that want another way to market their products. And it's not by people who are actually living on the ground in regenerative systems. And both of those camps, the, the marketing of products and the certifiers, turned their back on over 300 years of research in the natural resources, forestry, ecology world on the term regeneration. Regeneration actually has a definition that's almost 300 years old. It's, it's the, um, it's the uh, process that, that ensures the development of successive generations of plants that are all adapted to the site with the disturbance regime of that given area. This is a regenerative system. It will start with lichens and it will eventually go through mosses and grasses and then canes and vines. If you were to go pull up this grass right there, what would you find a clinging to the roots of the grass? Soil. Where did the soil come from? 
These natural plant communities create the soil. The solid rock becomes soil when you follow these ecological processes. Um, if regenerative agriculture doesn't follow ecological principles, I don't care who certifies you, it's not regenerative. And part of the regenerative process that we plug into with, with a restoration agriculture system is no matter where you are, uh, a piece of land, no matter where you are ecologically in ecological time, um, it is, there is a process in place that you can insert yourself into where the system develops and becomes more and more fertile, more species diverse, uh, things grow faster, retains more water, produces more yields, and this is the, this is the um, aggradation phase of um, succession. So we're going to mimic uh, natural succession in the area. Look at old fields around here. You see old fields abandoned, they start to grass in, and as the years go by, they start to have other things grow in until pretty soon it's a young shrubland, brushland, and you see trees over it. Then it closes the canopy, the grasses die out, and then it's a forest again. We're back to the, to the main forest. Some disturbance comes along, erases it all, and then it comes back. This is a regenerative system. So our systems that we're going to design uh, have these plant community types, and they come back again and again. They're designed here in Maine to tolerate wind. Uh, notice what happens here. We've got these, uh, these kind of these ditches that will accumulate more water. We're mixing the organic matter of the soil with the, um, with the mineral matter of the soil. It's resistant to large animal herbivory. Um, these can be quite common, and we can use these to imitate the uh, effects of these guys right here. I put him in there, or her in there, because he's cute. Uh, the systems around here are resistant to fire. So many of the species in, in this part of the world sprout back after fire. Ice storm, you're going to have ice storms that come through. These are not natural disasters. These are called normal. They're absolutely, totally normal. And if, and if we design an agriculture to live with this normal, we're OK, we're fine. Go ahead and burn my place to the ground. It's back next year. I love it. What if the Canadians come? How many of you guys are Canadian? What if the Canadians come down and invade North America and just like absolutely clear cut and destroy all of our crop fields? My crops come back. Do the potatoes come back? We can't feed the world unless we restore this beautiful planet. And, and we can grow food where agriculture can't go. Agriculture as we know it, you cannot plow the, the cliff on the, on the side of the road. How many of you guys seen trees growing on the cliffs on the side of the road? We all have. I mean, you guys haven't had your eyes open? This is a regenerative agriculture. It looks just like a mountain, right? Well, we know this is a regenerative agriculture because what this used to be prior to World War II, there were, there were three different uh, villages up in these mountains. Um, during World War II, the axis between Germany and uh, Italy never really got going because Mussolini had problems with these hill people. These hill people knew how to blow up, blow up all the tunnels that went through the mountains. And so the Italians really couldn't be effective because they were fighting against their own people with the Civil War going on. Eventually, Mussolini rounded everybody up, put them to work in the factories and in the fields, uh, and then everything was abandoned since World War II. <clears throat> well, the culture up in these hills there's a little, you can see a resi residual village there. We're going to make these stone terraces where you grew your crops. You grew wheat, you grow your garden vegetables, um, you have grapes and olives, and then you would graze animals. And then the trees all around you in the lower reaches, the trees were olives, um, uh, chestnut. Further up, there was uh, hazelnut and the pines. Once you get up in the pine, now pine zone was all Italian pine. And Italian pine makes uh, pine nuts. Uh, another tree that they kept a lot of was basswood because it produced the honey. So wait a minute. Since World War II, all of those trees, all of these food systems are reproducing. And you can go right up there today, and this is nothing but harvest. Harvest all oh, this walnut, also walnut up there. That is a food producing system that nobody has spent any money on. Think about how profitable this can be. We can spend nothing, and it will still produce yields. And we can grow in the cracks in the rocks. Everything from strawberries to salad greens, dandelion actually is a salad green, believe it or not. Um, we have bone set medicinal herbs. This is uh, penny royal, other medicinal herbs growing all over the place. This is the potential of ag this is potentially agricultural land, and this is from right here. This is this kind of stuff. We can grow food there. We don't need this flat alluvial soil, and that's what I wrote about. If you buy the book, buy it from Acres USA. Don't buy it from Amazon. Thank you very much, because I don't get paid that much for it. I didn't mean to win three literary awards that happened by accident. I guess you know, the 
kind of matter to somebody. Now back to the, the key, kind of whole key central thing with all of this is um, ecosystem mimicry and plant community mimicry. We don't have to invent families of plants that live together. You know, however plants got here on this planet, they've been living together for years and years and years. If you look at this map of North America, uh, most of you guys are aware of the fact that this is the human east. It uh, primarily would be closed canopy forest all the way north to south. Out here, this is the, um, the Great Plains. It's a lot more arid. Water is the biggest limiting factor. When you have water as a limiting factor, you have a lot more fire. And so with a lot more fire and a lot less water, you have a lot less trees. So these black uh, spots and gray areas here are the same trees and shrub bushes and vines that are in these black spots here. These are holes in the forest canopy. These are openings, and these are islands, oases in the grassland. And this whole area in the Midwest is a sloshing back and forth. There are some that are holes in the forest canopy, some are uh, shrublands that are coming back from succession, some are these big trees with grass underneath it. And these are all oak savanna, barrens, and prairie complexes. So this next list of species is part of your homework. It'll be on the test. And if you get anything wrong, you won't get a red star on your forehead. Um, Part of what's critical on any kind of uh, ecosystem mimicry is to understand what the ultimate long-term tree type is that's going to be in that particular area, what's best adapted for the climate, the soils, etc. Since trees live so long, they change the soil chemistry, they say change the soil biology, they will dominate the site. So this plant community type, this plant community type is dominated by the Fagaceae, which are oak, chestnut, and beech. Uh, what do they have in common? Nuts. Big nuts, right. Uh, oak and beech haven't had a lot of uh, interaction with humans for, for an extended period of time to do any selection, and so these still have uh, heavy years and light years of when they produce, whereas chestnut has been under cultivation by humans for so long that uh, the, the majority of the chestnuts produce crop every single year. So we have a tall tree uh, with nuts on it. Apples. What do you think, instead of having wild crab apples out there, what could we substitute for a wild crab apple? How about like domestic apples, big, juicy, tasty, whatever we want them for. So if we're going to create an imitation plant community, let's, let's substitute, I'll substitute chestnuts in, in the oak component. Um, apples for the apple component. Hmm, dominant shrub being hazelnut. Hmm, what should I use instead of hazelnuts? How about hazelnuts? And then the prunuses, we've got plums and cherries and peach and nectarines. There's a whole host of things we can use with cherries. Cherries are great also because there's some that are very low growing, some that are very tall growing, and they're compatible with almost all the other different plant community types. They're compatible with the walnut family, they're compatible with the pine family, etc. Then we have raspberries or blackberries, we've got grapes climbing on the whole mess, currants and gooseberries in the shade, uh, fungi decomposing. Everything, there's leaf fungi, there's stem fungi, there's wood fungi, there's free floating in the soil fungi, uh, and forage that the animals can eat, and of course, animals. Is there anything in this list that you can eat? Is there anything in that list that you could probably sell? Is there anything in that list that you could feed to an animal? Yeah. What do all of these plants do every single year? And what do all those animals do every single year? They produce more of themselves. So instead of planting potatoes, that maybe you'll get some volunteer in the second year, and then by the third year there's you know, one or two, and then there's nothing left ever again. We've got a system here that produces more of itself over and over and over and over again. It produces a surplus that we can sell, eat, uh, and, and then to sell propanules of it, nursery sales from it. And it's all perennial. It's there basically forever. This is a system in uh, Michigan. This is a uh, savanna remnant. <clears throat> Who knows what the dominant grazing animals were in Maine before people got here? <laughs> Not mastodon. Mastodons were the rest of the country. In Maine, the grazing animals were woolly mammoths. Woolly mammoths are native to Maine. These are the elephant uh, woodlands of North America. What do, what do elephants do? Have you ever seen elephants? You know, watch a television show or go over to the Serengeti in Africa. They take trees and they like knock them down, they shred them to pieces. What do these trees do again once they get shredded by elephants? 
they sprout back. Well, how do we imitate the effects of large animals on an ecosystem? How about with large animals? And how about with large animals that people recognize? Let's have cowies eating the grass and the broad leaves. Let's have piggies clean up almost everything. Turkeys eating bugs and seeds. We can have sheepies eating the broad leaves and browsing. Uh, eat what the cattle don't eat. And then we can have chickens also eating seeds and then they scratch apart the other animals in order to get, get the uh, fly larvae. So there's sanitation. And then we've got a little happy farmer over here um, who should be working a lot less and hopefully making a little money at it. One of the things that we also need to understand is these systems were, they were disturbed by big animals and they were disturbed by fire. And you know, forest fire, smoky bear is a really cool idea, let's not burn these forests down and all that kind of stuff. It's a little bit misguided. Forest fires are natural, normal parts of our healthy forests around here. Having an over accumulation of underbrush that catches on fire and burns the whole thing to a crisp is not necessarily what we want. So back with chestnuts, one of the things I like about chestnuts, it's not actually a nut, my, maybe my botanist friends can help me what the structure is called. It's, you know, it's a seed, and it's also not, it's, it's not a true tree nut. No human being has ever been shown to be allergic to chestnuts, and it's, it's not a high oil nut like other tree nuts are. It's mostly carbohydrate. It's more equivalent to brown rice or corn that grows on a tree. Apples, great for food, juice, vinegar, alcohol. These apples right here, these were grown in a full, complete, crazy ecosystem. Zero sprays have been certified organic since 1985. You don't have to be certified organic in order to do this. But I've done zero sprays for 23 years now. And look at the fruit quality on this. Why? Because it's grown in an ecosystem, not in an orchard. Say orchard, you got a picture of what an orchard is. It's all these apple trees and nothing else. You, you, know, you till onto the ground or you use herbicide on the ground. Um, and it's just apples, and this is nothing but a pest magnet that all comes in, and it's a disease magnet that comes in. And so when reality happens to you, people go, oh no, we have a problem. Now you have to spray against this problem instead of accept reality. If there are fruit that have pests, when we pick it, we throw it on the ground. You can't do that. The larvae will go into the soil and be more of them next year. Well, after we finish picking, we move out, the pigs move in. And they happily go through the orchard, they eat up all those apples with all the bugs in it, and they convert them into pork chops. That's how I prefer to deal with cobbling them off is by eating pork chops. What's neat is you go ahead and you stomp on these things, and you ferment it with oxygen, and it turns into vinegar, which is great for cleaning, for pickling other foods, um, good digestive aid, and then of course, my favorite way to deal with it is you squish the juice, and you ferment it without oxygen, and it becomes an alcoholic beverage, hard cider. How many of you people are five foot two inches tall? Who's five foot two? Somebody is, please. No, he's five foot two. Uh, John Adams, the second president of the United States, uh, was five foot two. He began every morning with a 42 ounce tanker of cider for breakfast because it settled his digestion. It's like, yeah, right. And this guy's a rip snorting president, a little tiny, stocky guy. Woo -woo. But then I was thinking about it, it's like, wait a minute, this was before sewers, wastewater treatment plant, and piped water in Washington, D.C., and it was probably lethal to drink the water. And maybe you did need it to settle your stomach. You have this beautiful little poison that you quaff every morning for breakfast. Hazelnuts, they're a shrub. They grow protein and oil. They're natural and native around here, both American hazelnut and beaked hazelnut. Um, and this is, uh, so with, with protein and oil, you go ahead and you squish the nut. And you get the oil out of it, you can use that as fuel in your, in your tractors, or you can use it as a salad oil. Um, and then you take uh, some of the oil and some of the uh, alcohol, because your cider, that your alcoholic cider doesn't taste good. You run it through a still, and the first third of the alcohol that comes off is fusel oils and methanol, make it go blind. You don't drink the tops, they're called. You add that to the oil, 20% um, tops with 80% oil, and you put it in a barrel in the corner of your garage for six months, eight months, and it turns into diesel fuel all by itself. No fancy dancing reactors. It just does that. And mm -hmm. run in your diesel vehicle tomorrow. When we do these new agricultural systems, what I'm not talking about are small, uh, hand-picked, everybody turns into an eco-peasant. What we need to do is design entire regions to be ecological production regions, and we have to mechanize things. That's me sitting on a straddle harvester uh, by the DEI company harvesting um, hazelnuts in Nebraska. 
around the world, except in a couple of countries that have horrible human rights abuse records, USA and China, for example, and Canada because there are lackeys and we own them and they don't admit to it. Apples are harvested by machines. They really are. Get over it. They're either harvested off the tree or they're harvested off the ground. The ones that are harvested off the ground are used in the juicing process. It's either pasteurized once it's all uh, picked um, or it's fermented and the alcohol kills everything. We need to design systems that are at scale so we can feed the 10 billion people that are out here. This is a nut picker rubber. It'll sweep up almonds, chestnuts, um, acorns, um, pecans, walnuts, sorry, I said walnuts, dog poop, golf balls, that kind of stuff. This is a black walnut facility in Stockton, Missouri. This is the scale we need to be at for these crops that aren't necessarily recognized right now as crops uh, in the U.S. We need to do this at scale. Now, can you do this on five acres, afford all this processing equipment? No. But if each one of us has five acres of a system like this, all combined, we can pool our resources together and have a processing facility that does all the things that we need it to do. And then we can access the real market, which is the, the largest <coughs> market out there, uh, and make our way that way. A lot of people say, well, you know, his nuts, they're only, I only see them on the end cap in the grocery store just before Thanksgiving. There's really not a lot of market for hazelnuts. It's like, well, time out. What's that stuff, that chocolatey stuff, that nut to, nut to, uh, yeah, Nutella, right? This is a Ferrero Rocher company built an $85 million processing facility west, west of Guelph, Ontario to process hazelnuts. Where are they getting the hazelnuts from? Not here. They're getting them from, they're getting them from South America, mostly from Chile. They're getting them from Bataan. They're getting them from Turkey. And if we can't ship hazelnuts, from Prescott, Isle, Maine to Guelph, Ontario, cheaper than they can ship hazelnuts from the time, then we have a problem, okay? Know what the problem is, really? The real problem? We're not producing enough hazelnuts. They can't buy hazelnuts from us because we don't have enough. They're gonna need at least a container a week, 20,000 pounds uh, a week, so there's, there's 20 acres a week, times however many weeks of the year. They run three shifts um, a day. 365 days out of the year. In order to access the real market for hazelnuts, we have to be at scale. We just have to. And we don't have to do it individually, we can do it um, collaboratively. The walnut family, there's a couple of different um, species in there. This is mostly black walnut or uh, the English walnut. They're compatible with cherries, plums, peach, almonds, apricots, nectarines, raspberries, blackberries, elderberries, currants, gooseberries, grapes, fungi, forage, animals. Once again, is there anything in here that's an annual? Is there anything that we can eat? Is there anything that we can sell? Any place where we can grow any kind of walnut species, we can grow a perennial uh, agriculture that's very affordable to operate. All the pest and disease control is taken care of within its own self in ecological processes. Pecans in warmer places. Actually, the farthest north native range of pecan is the southwestern corner of Wisconsin. It gets 30 below zero every, you know, every once in a while test winter. The pecans would easily grow up over here because you're a lot warmer um, in Maine. However, what you might not have is enough heat units in the summertime to ripen a crop. Passion fruit, uh, what else is thrown in there that's not? Persimmon, all of those are cold hardy enough to grow here. Why aren't we trying those? Anybody go to like the grocery store, you can like, go to Walmart and see all these different passion fruit this and uh, passion fruit that. Um, hickories, shagrat hickory. This, this, thing was generated, this image was generated by um, whatever, where did it go? Uh, CSRIO or something like that in, in Canada. I think what they did is if a province had an example of hickory that light up the whole province, because I really doubt that there's uh, hickories up by Baffin Island near Greenland, they really aren't. However, I know the hickories grow right down the road here because I have quite a few hickories that I've planted um, in, in uh, Springfield area. I actually got a letter from the uh, State of Maine Department of Forestry informing me this, oh, dear ignorant landowner, did you know that you have one of the farthest north stands of hickory growing, shagbark hickory growing in the state of Maine, and you need to take great care and pains to take care of this little stand of hickory. It's like, <clears throat> excuse me, guys, uh, I planted them there. And the ones that weren't adapted to that site died. The ones that are adapted to the site are still there. <laughs> And then pine, probably the most uh, ubiquitous uh, tree type all across the country is the pine. Various different species in different places. Um, here in, in Maine would be uh, white pine, five needle pine. It doesn't make big pine nuts. Well, there's another white pine in the same family that does. It's the Korean pine. It's basically the pine nut of world trade. 
well, doggone it, if the pine tree state can't grow pines in quantity, and you can start to get yields in the early years, so let's go ahead and have a clear-cut area of good pine ground within five, six years. Now we have pine nuts coming off of this place. We're producing an agricultural crop while we're growing the timber long-term. So we're getting both values out of it, long-term timber and, and uh, pine nuts. And the one I really would like a university to pick up on here in Maine, perhaps, one that's interested in being innovative with a, a plant that's everywhere in the northern two-thirds of Maine is the beech tree. The oldest known preserved food on the planet is actually beech nut butter. It was found in a, in a, in a bog in, I think it was Finland or Sweden, one of those countries. Um, what if we all of a sudden had a program where we participated with hunters? If you see a beech tree that's thigh high or shorter that has nuts on it, GPS it. Get us a sample of nuts if you have nuts available at that time. Or at least GPS it. And then what we'll do at the university is we'll figure out where these are, and we'll get cuttings from it, we'll do hardwood cuttings and softwood cuttings. We'll bring all of these short little trees that have super fast to reproduce genetics in them, and now we'll get them breeding with each other. And then we start doing the mass selection with the Burbank style to get the trees that are disease resistant, fast to yield, and then yield the most. And we can have the next crop. We want to sell a total uh, main local crop. This is, the, this is the state that has the highest percentage of beech of any other state uh, in, the, in the country. Yeah, this is like beech nut central, why not? Of course, hazelnut, blueberries. Maine is already topping blueberries. Why was it that umpteen eons ago, somebody figured out, you know all these wild locust blueberries around here? We could build an industry on that. Why hasn't anybody said that with beech nuts? Why hasn't anybody said that with pine, with wintergreen, et cetera, et cetera? Well, there used to be in, in a lot of those industries. So, one of the things I just want to point out, most small farms, almost 90% of all farms, qualify as small farms according to the USDA. And if we slice this even finer, 50% um, of all farms, people who file IRS Schedule F, earn less than $10,000 a year in farm revenues. So the point is, oh, we need to change that, earn more money. It's like, no, the point is, the majority of farmers aren't doing this to make a killing. So if we're not going to do this to make a killing, why don't we do this to make a change? Why don't we earn our $10,000 a year? And if, if you're earning $10,000 a year, you're not making any money with $10,000 a year. Like 10, 10, 10. What if we add all these 10s up? We have a $2 million business starting right here in Presque Isle because we decided to actually work with one another. It could be a co-op, it could be a, you know, a corporation, whatever it is. Let's start the, you know, the Presque Isle Beach Nut Blah Blah Federation Society of Broke Farmers. Um, and then across the board, e even on the big ag, um, nobody's making any money in agriculture. The majority of all farmers are getting the majority of their income from off the farm, period. So instead of trying to lure people into trying to make that next buck, trying to make that next buck, the people who are passionate about this, let's do it for less work, Less money, it's going to cost us less money to do a natural system, right? If you plant this little system, you kind of like walk away a little bit, just manage it a little bit, and we make a couple of bucks here and there off of a couple of different crops. All of a sudden, we're earning our $10,000 a year, and we're going on vacation a lot more, spending a lot more time out on the lakes instead of out in the fields. Um, and that's part of this. I'm just going to fly through this. Uh, it was another one of these freak accidents. When I moved to southwest Wisconsin. I joined this little group of ragtag fugitives that were, I was grower number 24 in a cooperative. Um, and I grew produce. Uh, the year prior to this, a couple of the other produce growers uh, also were dairy farmers. They decided to contract with a cheese manufacturer to make cheese on Monday morning because um, it was only like a few hundred gallons that they had available to, to be able to run through the system. And so, in the past 20 years, we went from 24 growers with gross sales in the whole co-op of around $300,000 to what you'll see a slide later on of, of gross sales. And this is our logo. You guys are probably familiar, at least a little bit familiar with this. This is called Organic Valley. This is the headquarters in the far of Wisconsin. This is our produce warehouse. Five different climate zones, everything from potatoes to onions and squash and peppers. Um, oh yeah, by the way, this is June in Wisconsin. You guys think it's cold here, right? Um, uh, there's enough, there's enough um, production going on that now there's spin-off businesses. Instead of me having to have a greenhouse to start on when spring starts, you know, for peppers or tomatoes or whatever, 
there's enough of us together that we can have Ruben go do it in his greenhouses. So now Ruben has a business that he can actually uh, grow all our, our plant starts for us. And also supplies a lot of people who are doing, you know, a, a quote unquote niche product or vegetable product or certified organic have a hard time getting things. Well, how you get things is you start a business that supplies those things. So you can't start a business to supply those things unless you have a large enough pool of people that's now the market. So we were our own market, so Ruben could start this supply business. He's now our seed broker and our equipment. I can go get anything to do with irrigation or transplant, I can rent equipment from him, he starts, all my starts for me. Another thing is with feed, it's like, well, I, I can't afford to buy a ship feed in from, you know, Idaho to feed my chicken certified organic, this or that, and the other thing. Well, start an organic feed mill. Well, you can't start an organic feed mill if, unless you have enough people that are actually purchasing that feed. So this started with, I think it was 25 um, poultry producers, went to this feed mill, said, hey, little feed mill, you will now start supplying um, you know, us with organic feed. We'll grow it, you store it, you mill it, you mix it with the, the mineral amendments that you get from this particular place and we guarantee to buy it back. So with this written you know, guarantee, is like we'll supply you with the ingredients and we'll buy it back, you store it, you mix it, you blend it, you have a business. Um, Cast and Farm Supply is one of the largest suppliers uh, in the Midwest of certified organic grains and feeds and inputs. Another thing is like, well, why would I raise things organic or differently if I have to sell them in the regular marketplace? Well, we have our own sale barn that sells, you know, certified organic products. So you don't have to be certified organic to do this, but whatever you do, instead of all of us trying to do something by ourselves alone in the middle of nowhere and buying products from far in the field, let's work together. Somehow work together so we can at least buy bulk. Um, and this is our... <laughs> This is our headquarters building, lovingly called the Death Star. It's not complete, but it's fully functional, I assure you. 36 loading docks around here for trucks. The, the produce, this is the produce section over here. There's uh, four different docks for cars, and there's one dock for Amish buggies. Wow, a loading dock in a warehouse like this for Amish buggies? And do you think renewable energy is a pretty cool idea? Well, why not power your place with renewable energy? What happened to this wind turbine? Was that a, is it not built yet, or did it like <laughs> fail? Oh, <laughs> this is afterwards you buy me a solar pop. We'll talk about it. <laughs> now, now there's over. We, we produce our own biodiesel. We do our own straight vegetable oil. I love the laughter. I can go to my, you know, I can go downtown to Lafarge, Wisconsin. I can swipe my card and I can put diesel fuel in my my car, my delivery truck that was grown by our local producers. It sounds like a cool idea. Oh, you can go to the local greasy spoon and get your five gallons of vegetable and you do diesel fuel. That's not a fuel system. A fuel system is how much fuel do you need in the course of a year? We need this much fuel. How much do sunflowers, for example, produce? In our areas, between 120 and 150 gallons of oil per acre. We use this much oil. We need these many acres of sunflowers. We need this equipment to actually su supply us with that much oil and then the rest of the surplus that we sell. Bang! That's a fuel system. Um, it's, it's not a cute little feel-good Thing. We have over a billion dollars in sales. It's a, it's a human institution, it has its flaws and faults, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the point here is whatever you guys do in this area, whatever it is that we're doing with a sustainable, perennial, ecosystem based agriculture, do it with other people and have it turn into a regional thing so it's now it's going to restore the local economy. You guys ever seen any small towns up here that aren't really doing that well? Half the buildings are empty and falling apart? Well, guess what? That was the same thing going on with us out there. Now they're all full. We got like three or four different um, serious five-star, amazing local farm-to-table restaurants in that part of the world. How many private booksellers are there left anymore? And this is in a town, this is in a town of about 4,000 people. And so it's, it's not much different than out here. Um, we have a, a prosperous local economy. We have our own radio station, WDRT, it's here for dirt. Um, <laughs> when they upscaled the schools, they, they regionalized all the schools back in the 70s, I think it was. Um, they abandoned all these school buildings, and so this particular school was purchased for a dollar. A dollar! That's pretty cheap and affordable. And then you rehab and upgrade it. Um, permaculture green space and outdoor classroom. I wonder who had a hand in that kind of stuff. Well, the first graduating class of that, uh, that um, Waller School, or Pleasant Ridge Waller School, 
they got out and they're like, well, we don't want to go to public school, and our parents don't want to or can't homeschool us. Let's start our own high school. So they set up all their bylaws and they wrote it all up and they filed the papers with the state to start their own high school called the Youth Initiative High School. And they were denied licensure by the state. It's like, well, you creeps, why? Well, because they didn't have anybody who was 18 on the board of directors. So they got somebody's mom to be on the board of directors. And to this day, the majority of the school board at Pleasant Ridge Waller School, I mean, at uh, Youth Initiative High School, are students. And so you can imagine that's a little bit ruthless on teachers. Uh, what started as one classroom down at that corner with like six students is now the top two stories of this building and they have like, I think it's um, 30 different students from around the world that come here to go to that, just go to that high school. Every kind of alternative animal health and fitness is probably more body workers per capita anywhere else. Uh, the most amazing little food co-op um, for a tiny little town of 4,000. And if people are catching the bug, there's so many yards, it's really, really cool I stay out of it, but there's a big, you know, political war going on between the people say, oh no, you have to have mowed lawn instead of growing food in your front yard. But there's a lot of this crazy stuff going on. And it immediately reminds me of this. Let's take Prescott Isle and let's plant a food ecosystem in the whole entire region and manage it accordingly. And then if we happen to get invaded by those mean, nasty, boot kicking Canadians, we go away for 40, 50, 60 years, we come back and, and the agriculture is all set up for us. It's still here, just like in Northern Italy. And maybe it'll be sustainable enough to last as long as, as this um, uh, beautiful being right here. It actually sat, I don't know if it's a her or a him, this is a tree. This is uh, El Castaño de Cento Cavalli. At one point in time, it was the largest diameter trunk of any tree ever measured on the planet Earth some 70, 75 feet across the base of the trunk. You can see where the main trunk used to go up this way. It's a chestnut tree, and it's approximately 4,000 years old. For 4,000 years, this thing has grown in the solid rock on the site of Mount Etna in Sicily, and it goes through about 300 to 400 earthquakes a year. It's been burned by volcanic eruptions several different times in its 4,000 year history. And every single year, without any care from human beings whatsoever, it puts out tons of chestnuts as a crop for all the critters to eat. Squirrels obviously love it. Um, why can't we create an agriculture that's that sustainable? And look at the forest around us right here. You know, human beings have only been messing with this woods for the past 150, 200 years at the most. Um, this, is, this is, right here, uh, some of the most remote parts of the United States of America to this day. Uh, and yet it's been abused by how many generations of, of saws and axes that have done it. And it's still here, and it's still coming back. This place is amazingly resilient, and if we imitate those powers of resiliency and its ability to reproduce itself and continue going on, and if we derive our livelihood from it, not just by cutting it down and shipping it away as toilet paper, I was going to do a hand gesture that goes with that, but to sell it as value-added products and have processing facilities going on right here, we can have a prosperous local economy that's based on the ecology of this place, that's in harmony with this place, that can tolerate the floods, the frost, the ice storms, the hot, the cold, um, the droughts, the animals. And um, we're going to do this by managing our water and obtain yields from the water. This is New Forest Farm before the water management pattern. Afterwards, there's ponds everywhere for amphibians, which is uh, insect control for watering stations for livestock. We're going to disturb the site. We're going to go through it here, in this case, with a chipper. We've uh, imitated the effects, perhaps, of fire, like getting rid of all this organic matter. Um, then we're going to establish our uh, closely mimicked plant community, community using our forestry practices. That's a tree transplanter. We can do 10,000 trees a day with that thing. This is not orchard style growing of stuff. We do alley cropping. So this is alley cropping, which is you continue to grow whatever your crop is in the alley, and then you plant your rows of trees, and while the trees mature, you're harvesting your cash crop. And let's say this was potatoes, right? So this is all potatoes, and you plant your future, you plant your future ecosystem in rows that are wide enough to accommodate the equipment that's used in those systems. And what we're going to do is as the system gets more mature, we disturb it. <laughs> go do some crop in the space in between, or we'll leave trees here and here. It's similar to a group shelter woodcut. Since I know that there's no foresters out here, I won't talk about it much, but it's a similar principle 
They don't teach orchardists how to do a shelter wood cut, and that's a critical part of managing an ecosystem over time. Uh, sunflowers are grown around here. Well, there's a term that I'm going to put out there, and you guys should remember this, is the land equivalent ratio. And if you grow sunflowers on a solid acre, that's, that's one. You have one crop of sunflowers. Well, if you grow chestnuts, well, that's chestnuts. On a solid acre, that's one crop of chestnuts. Uh, well, if you grow 80% um, of a crop of sunflowers and then 50% of a crop of chestnuts on the same acre of ground, 80 plus 50 is 130, you get a 30% increase in your overall site yield. You get decreases in yield on your sunflowers because you're only getting 80% of a yield, decreases in your yield on your chestnut because you're only getting 50% of a yield. That's a total yield of 1.3 times the amount of yield that you were getting before. Cereal rye between apples, hazelnuts, highly hybrid poplar. This isn't hard to understand. Silvo pasture is planting trees in your pasture, not grazing cows in your woods. There's no grass there. We can open up the woods a little bit, strategically here and there in the right places. Um, we can use other animals. We can use pigs. This isn't turning pigs loose in the woods to have them root it all up and turn it into a pigsty. This is strategically moving the pigs and making sure they have enough forage to feed them. And this is, this is based on the oak plant community type right there. They get food from the, from the perennials starting in June and goes all the way until right now. Let's episodically disturb the site. This was planted 15 years prior. All this stuff comes up, looks like a jungle. Some of the things that are in there, we've got grape and, and, and mulberries and raspberries and uh, hybrid poplars and chestnuts hazelnuts. This kind of farming is zombie proof because zombies only recognize gardens. Herb spirals or 16 brick rocket stoves if you're a permaculturist. We go disturb the site. This is a pre-commercial city. We go through and we harvest some small saw logs, some firewood. Uh, some wood is inoculated with mushrooms for culinary mushrooms and um, medicinal mushrooms. And the other stuff is just chipped on the site. And this is what it looks like after pre-commercial thinning. We had reason to go out there because we were earning money. That's what it looks like immediately after the chipping. And we're going to farm the, dis the, the decay cycle as well. The decay cycle is what releases our nutrients. And so we inoculate all these uh, stems with strafarium mushroom spawn. $7 a pound wholesale if I'm selling these things. You get absolutely. Uh, I think for the past month and a half, um, it's a very wet summer in Wisconsin, we eat mushrooms at least two, sometimes three meals a day. It's great. Fantastic. This is what uh, the pine plant community type would look like 75 years down the line. It's time to harvest some pine, and maybe we go back to potatoes after, after the pine. This is regenerative agriculture. It's got hazelnut grapes. It's got, um, uh, of course, I can't identify half the stuff now. It's got uh, currants, gooseberries. We got ornamental ferns. Um, is this regenerative agriculture? I'm not quite so sure. So my vision for places like Maine, for example, there's a lot of Maine that looks like this. It's been seriously harvested, some would argue abusively harvested. This kind of mimics a catastrophic blowdown, you know, a sheer wind kind of knocks everything out, or a fire and get, gets rid of all the organic matter. We can replant that, and we can replant that with the species that actually produce food. The UN does not consider this to be agricultural land, but we can. We can get yields out of that, and this can start to cash flow and pay a, a positive cash flow starting next year if we do it right. So 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the line, we have a place like that that's 100% food growing everywhere. That's part of my vision, and that's part of what I've been doing on this property here in Southwest Wisconsin. Because, folks, when, when I was a little kid, my dad would tell us stories about being up here in Maine when you could actually go out to the streams and rivers and you could like scoop fish out with a pitchfork and put them in a boat. Um, and that there were deer, there were white-tailed deer in herds of like 10, 15,000 deer out there and you just gun them down and you hang, they got pictures of like, these old black and whites from, you know, like my, my grandpa was a hunting and fishing guy down in um, West Grand Lake area. And they'd have 20 or 30 deer hanging from the trees, huge deer. Well, if they shot them all away, that we destroyed that resource base. We can get that resource base back. We can have that abundance back. Um, they inherited a rich, abundant planet that became degraded. There is no more room where we can go. We, we've, we've inherited a plastic-covered, toxic 
um, radioactive cinder of a planet, and it's up to somebody to return it back to a more productive state. We know how to do this. We need to do this at scale on huge swaths of the planet, um, one step at a time with the resources that we have, starting right here with our own selves. And um, the eyes of the future are looking back at us and praying we see beyond our own time. Just as an aside, I'm not really one of these like pointy hat, love circle, smoking Buddha kind of guys. Uh, but I like this image because what we need to do is we need to turn the back, our back on the kind of civilization that creates these conditions. Regardless of your political bent, our current civilization creates these conditions. And it's time to create something that looks a lot more like that. Or if you look out the window tomorrow morning as the sun comes up, it's going to be a beautiful sunny day tomorrow, right? With spectacular colors everywhere. Let's create a world that looks more like that. That's all I have to say for the night. Thank you. Not from Somerville, where are you from? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I was born in China and then I lived in Vermont for a few years and I lived in Springfield. Where in Vermont? Um, Isle of Vermont, the other state. Okay. Because right. the other half of my family is from Vermont. Yeah. I went to St. John's Reed Academy High School. Okay. Acres. That farm right there is about, that's about 110. About 110. Um, and, and what uh, all of these areas here are alley cropped, and this, the yellow is all sunflower. Uh, so that was for an oil crop, and then after oil is, is pressed off, then the meal is livestock feed for chickens and pigs. Um, all my oil got stored in these, uh, these tanks. It's just a classic steel tank up on, on a gravity feed steel tank. The neat plots like this are uh, where I put annuals. So right in here and here and here would be uh, like winter squash and green peppers. Um, these four bands, one, two, three, four, are all asparagus. I've got two acres of asparagus. Um, I get about half the yields of asparagus. But all these trees out here, up top are chestnut. Uh, this is mostly fruit. It's apples and pears. Uh, these are all hazelnut. This is uh, a mix of hazelnut and chestnut. And over here is where I have like uh, butternuts and uh, those sort of things. And, and this, uh, those of you who know anything about organic certifications, you get inspected once a year and you have to fill out all your forms. Well, I've got 100 acres of grass, 110 acres of grass. And I've got you know, these many acres of all these different other crops. I've got 100 acres of, of nut crops. And I've got 100 acres of grass. And then I got like 50 acres worth of annual crops growing. It's like, well, wait a minute. How many acres do you actually have? I have 110. And I'm growing more than one crop on the same. Well, you can't do that. You have to have a separate field number. It's like, well, then you come out here and you label this for me. This is one farm that's managed as a single system, which actually makes it easy to manage. If you think about a lot of these farms that also have a wood lot associated with it, you're concentrating on the ag and you're not paying attention to the forestry because you only have to go in there every you know, 10 or 15 years or so and do something. And then when you go in there after 10 or 15 years, you notice that there's all these invasive species out there and we've got to do something about it. And it becomes a big hassle. Whereas if you're managing both the woodlot and the agriculture in the same place, when I'm out here taking care of my agriculture, it's taking care of my woods. When I'm out here taking care of my woods, it's taking care of my agriculture. So I've taken care of the whole thing. I have all the invasive species that I could possibly have in this in that neck of the woods, but there's there none of them are really causing a problem because they're all limited by the fact that I'm constantly working the whole the whole property. So you didn't even ask that question. Thank you for asking it. <laughs> so the Canadians pissed at me now. I can just look at this guy. Okay. <laughs> you know, all right, so here's here's a project for you. We have this university start doing uh, beach, right? Uh, <laughs> he didn't flinch. Uh, but if you go around the world, there is uh, high altitude coffee. You've heard about they're growing different high altitudes. The whole green revolution idea was to go around the world and find the most broadly adapted genetics. When you plant them on these mountainsides where you have this huge, wide swath of climactic zones, and let them cross pollinate freely, and then you grab from the middle range 
which means it will grow in the colder climates and it will grow in the warmer climates, these genetics grow. Well, let's go the other direction. Let's do the same thing and go around the world finding high altitude coffee, um, five, 10,000 feet in the Andes and, and Kilimanjaro, Mount Meru, um, Mount Kenya. Great vacation hobby. And then we bring the beans back here and you start planting them up in Canada. They can tolerate, in your case, 40 below zero. They can tolerate that because they, they get it up there on the mountain. Well, now let's have them cross pollinate with one another and now start selecting for a native Canadian coffee. Now, if we mix native Canadian coffee with the native Canadian hazelnuts, which I'm starting to supply to Canada, and then which one of you wants to start the cocoa project? You go around, find all the high altitude cocoa, and while you're living your life doing whatever you're doing, either having a job or making $10,000 on your farm, continue to make your $10,000 on your farm, and let's have this hobby of breeding ice cold tolerant cocoa plants and coffee plants to sit down and have a cup of coffee and a chocolate bar with hazelnuts in it that was locally grown in Prescott, Maine. I'm all for that. It's really, really cool. So see, he uncrossed his arms and finally warmed them up. Good. <laughs> and he can still play hockey. It's all right. <coughs> yes, sir. This isn't really a question, but I find it interesting that many of the tree species you mentioned or either have been eliminated, like American chestnut or beech, are on their way out. In fact, I've GPS a couple of individuals where they don't have beech bark disease. Canada plum, likewise, almost never develops fruit around here because it gets that smut. So a lot of the things you mentioned you've either adapted to using Asian or European species, I assume, like chestnut, right? Well, um, so, so, I also... How do you think this fits into trying to adapt to some of the invasive pests that have decimated some of our native species. Well, because also think of the native species is the selection pressure has been there. So let's just take that plum, because plum, you know, prunus is across the board, really susceptible to a lot of fungal diseases. Well, in the natural system, they get the fungus and they don't reproduce, they die, they go extinct. Unless the conditions are perfect, the disturbance regime has to be so that it allows for those to reproduce and express all these different genotypes. We're not allowing that to happen. And, and butternut's another example. It, it, it's basically in de steep decline across its range. Well, now let's insert ourselves back into the, to the program and say, all right, <coughs> let's start working with the Canadian plum. Let's start working with Canadian plum and let's plant zillions of these little plums. And then this seems counterintuitive, but it's not. Let's now intentionally infect them with the disease because we want to know as quickly as possible if they're resistant or not. And so if they die, good riddance, they're gone. And now with, with genetic testing, once we figure out what the genes are that, that code for that particular susceptibility, then we just make sure in our breeding work, we've got a little young plant that didn't die right away, but still has a gene, maybe we won't use that in our breeding work. So we only use the ones that don't have that gene. So I, I say let's include them right away. And American chestnut, did you know, actually American chestnut is increasing in range in the United States of America, naturally. This is not the American Chestnut Foundation's work or the American Chestnut Collaborator's work. This is naturally native on its own. It's expanding. It's actually almost considered an invasive species in the state of Oregon. What the heck? So we need to insert ourselves back into that whole process of how does that plant reproduce? It has some sort of value to us. Um, I think if, if you've ever eaten butternuts, I don't know who's ever eaten butternuts. Um, it's a large nut. It's a, in the walnut family. It's similar to a uh, California walnut, but it doesn't have that dry, astringent taste to it. It's a really smooth, sweet, creamy um, flavor to it. It almost tastes like it's already been sweetened with maple syrup. And why not have a butternut uh, industry in the state of Maine? It grows all over the place up here where it can survive. So yeah, let's do it. And it just takes breeding. A lot of people, this goes back again, a lot of people say, well, it takes forever for trees to produce seed. Well, those are the wrong trees. And, and with, with uh, hazelnut, I have a three-year cutoff. If it's not flowering in three years, that's it. I'm not going to play with those genetics anymore. Chestnut, I'm a little bit more lax on. It's going to be five years. It's not reproducing in five years. Um, there, there are chestnuts. There's two family lines of chestnuts that I have that you put the seed in the ground and it flowers right out of the seed. So what we can do with that is we go, we grow it here for a season, pollinate it, get that seed out of here, and then grow the seed down in South America, and just start doing this back and forth thing. Um, 
with and, and rapidly accelerate tree breeding. Um, so with hazelnuts, uh, the hybrid hazelnuts that we're growing out of the controlled cross uh, seedlings that we sell, uh, about 50 to 75 percent of them will flower the second year. If you put them in the ground this year, next year to flower. And uh, it doesn't take long. It takes three years to discover the ones that will do that. So let's do butternut. Within three years, we know that those don't have that super fast, that hyper precocity gene in them. So you can still be the champion of a beech nut breeding program here at the University of Maine Presque Isle before you retire. <laughs> He's actually 35, don't tell anybody this. It's been stressful for him here, I understand. Did that, is that kind of adequately answer? No, I don't. Yeah. And you look familiar. I know I saw you in the hall earlier. No, it was with the next time. Yeah. So high. Thank you. Yes, sir. What's your position on uh, uh, gene editing or biotechnology in permanent agriculture? It's around, and people are going to do it. I don't think that there are any, uh, let's take chestnut, for example. We don't need to put genes from other species in the chestnut until we've figured out how to work with all the chestnut genes. When we start introducing new genes to something, we don't know what the downstream effects are. We know a chestnut's a chestnut, a chestnut's a chestnut. It's been chestnut here for at least 900 million years. It's been around into the 900 million year thing. So it probably won't screw things up terribly, but if we do something with another gene going in, we don't know. We just don't know what the downstream effects can be. And I wrote a little bit in my book about um, I, I, I actually got removed from a tomato growers workshop in the Great Lakes uh, vegetable growers meeting one winter when the, the researcher was saying, look, this, this new um, uh, you know, genetically edited uh, tomato plant is resistant to tobacco mosaic virus number one. And here's the math. Out of nine, I don't know how many it was, but say out of nine million um, times that it's bit by a aphid that has tobacco mosaic virus number one, virus goes in, and how, how viruses replicate, the DNA opens up, it zips in, it codes off of that, well then the virus goes away unchanged. Well, out of like X percent of the times the virus goes in, it goes away changed. It's a different virus when it leaves. But according to you know whatever our statistical analysis is statistically insignificant. I said, excuse me, yes it's statistically insignificant, but what you just did is out of 100 million replications, you've created 10,000 new variations of tobacco mosaic virus number one. Factually, you just did. I'm not saying it's bad or whatever. You just, you just told me that you created 10,000 new viruses. Well, but look, it's statistically insignificant because our statistics say that that's so. Yeah, but that's real. We've created, you know, every time another aphid bites this thing, we've got new viruses that are being produced and we have no idea what they're going to do. So I'm a little bit leery of that. The one that, that I have a little soft spot for is the whole uh, American chestnut. It's like, well, yeah, you know, if it takes a wheat smut gene to prevent a chestnut blight, because I've seen some amazingly grand American chestnuts, like, I can all of a sudden get a soft spot for it. Well, then, if you start talking about nuclear transfer, and we go ahead and we take some mastodon and to mastodon and have an elephant gestated. It's like, oh my gosh, I'd love to have elephants, mastodons on my farm. So what's my position on it? I'm totally mixed, but I think with, with classical mass selection breeding, we don't need it. And one of the things about that is, is we, can, we can beat uh, uh, gene editing on speed uh, to the field because we don't need $10 million facilities and clean rooms and all these employees and stuff like that. All we need is a room like this and we've got literally a million plants that were super hyper accelerated. And another thing that I got, I got a lot of, lot of crap for. So in that tobacco mosaic virus thing, while continuing to ask questions, they brought security in to help me out because they didn't want me to bring up those points. Um, continually, geneticists will say, you can't select for more than one trait at a time. Because when you do, the math goes through the roof and it just blows up. And the number of replicants that you need, you just can't do it. It's like, well, duh, that's why we do mass selection. Because to select for more than one trait per generation, you need hundreds, sometimes hundreds of thousands of replicants. Well, let's do it. 
That's these fields right next door with all those little stakes out there in the fields. Let's do it. Let's have a hundred thousand different a little beech tree that's three years old is only going to be that tall. You can put them in three inches away from each other. There's literally a hundred million beech seeds out there, and you just have students going up and down, up and down the roads. Got one little flower, bang, gets tagged, and it's marked, and that's part of the program. It goes somewhere else, and they cross with one another. Because we, that's fast. We can really do that fast. And four by eight um, nursery bed, I can I can do about a thousand chestnut trees in a four by eight nursery bed. Well, I think given the time, and if there are any more questions, I'd say thank you, Mark. And thank you, everybody, for being here. And, and thank you for those who I, I verbally harassed for not becoming excessively new with me. Well, the Canadians ran out of it.